Okay then, everyone, I now make it 1300 Eve time, so we are going to begin with the class. Uh, this channel is for Mimitar Ships 101, hopefully you spotted that from the title. Uh, my name is Bobby Rush, I'll be in this class. Uh, I have been a teacher in the university for about six months now, and I have played Eve on and off across a diff- couple of different characters for nearly four years. I am a Mimitar enthusiast. I tend to fly Mimitar frigates and cruisers when I've given the opportunity. The duration of today's class was initially scheduled to be 60 minutes, and I'm still going to try to cover the majority of the topics in 60 minutes. Um, However, the event, which was scheduled for 1400, has now been pushed back by half an hour, so uh, we may overrun by an extra maybe 15 or 20 minutes, just because we've got the time now. Before we begin with class proper, there are a couple of class rules that I always have to say at the beginning, and those ones are, please make sure that you have your uh, mumble settings configured for push to talk, or that you have yourself muted, or have some other method of making sure that you do not uh, talk during the class. Uh, That just helps us not to get distracted and for terrible feedback and echoing to occur. If you do have any questions, hints, you'd like me to pause, slow down, or re-clarify anything, please feel free to ask in the class.e-uni chat. I would request that you prefix with a Q and a colon, as I have just done there in the class channel. That allows me to find them when I scroll back up through the channel. If you have, uh, if you could, sorry, keep the class.e-uni channel just to relevant commentary, please. Uh, that's again, stops the screen from scrolling too far. Okay, the general um, syllabus for this is going to be um, Mimitar ships and their characteristics as an overview. So we'll talk about the types of things which distinguish Mimitar ships from other ships, such as the Margolendi and Kaldari ships. We will discuss a little bit and projectile weapons. Uh, This is because projectile weapons are the primary method of damage application for most Mimitar ships. However, as we will see later on, many Mimitar ships use multiple or different weapons systems. And then the largest bulk of the class will be a, a one-by-one overview of each of the Tech 1 subcapital non-faction ships in the um, Mimitar line. What this means, we'll be talking about the, the regular vanilla T1 frigates, destroyers, cruisers, battle cruisers, and battleships. We're not going to be covering any Tech 2 ships, any capital ships, or any of the uh, faction or pirate variants. And that hopefully will take the whole 60 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A towards the end for anything that we haven't covered already in questions. So before I begin with class topics, do we have any initial questions? Okay, it looks like everyone understands for today. Right then. Mimitar ships, um, like all the ships in EVE, have particular flavours which make them unique. The largest uh, thing that makes Mimitar ships different from others is they tend to be the fastest, the most manoeuvrable, the most agile ships in their classes. So while it's true to say that frigates are almost always faster than destroyers and destroyers are almost always faster than cruisers, the Mimitar line will be the fastest. What this means for pilots is that generally they're able to dictate the range of engagements if they are fighting against other people, and also it tends to mean that they're able to avoid a lot of damage, not through having strong resists and defences, but by you know, uh, the fact that guns and missiles tend to do less damage towards faster targets. The other overriding principle for the Mimitar ship design philosophy is versatility. You tend to find that many Mimitar ships are able to field multiple different types of weapons, that the weapons that they can field are able to deal uh, a range of different types of damage. They're not locked into just doing one particular type of damage. You will also find that most Mimitar ships can be tanked effectively as either shield or armour tanking ships. And that some Mimitar ships have um, active shield tanking bonuses, such that uh, such that they can feel to the shield boosters uh, much more effectively than you might find on, say, a Kaldari ship. 
Now, with this versatility does come a drawback. In order to get the most out of almost all Mimitar ships, you're likely to have to need a wider variety of skill points spread across your character. So some ships can be very, very skill-intensive. This, of course, does mean that when you are flying a Mimitar ship, especially in PvP, uh, when you come up against an opponent, that opponent may not necessarily initially immediately know how your ship is fit. This again can give you an advantage. Uh, they may, the, the Hurricane, for example, is a battlecruiser we'll be discussing later, and it's quite common to see Hurricanes built as both armor ships with uh, very little range that actually coming in close and hitting you very high and staying within your damage range as well. But you'll also see hurricanes set up to be very fast shield ships with long range weapons that keep out of your range. So until the engagement begins, you won't necessarily have a good clue as to what you're going to be fighting against. What this does mean that if you want to be a Mimitar pilot down the line, you are going to be quite well placed to cross train into other ships due to the fact that in order to fly the Mimitar you must have a lot of different type of weapon and tanking skills trained or modules trained to a high degree. It means that going from Mimitar to Galente, for example, would only really involve a change into using the hybrid type of weapons because many Mimitar ships have drone base, so you would likely already have drones. And many Mimitar ships can armor tank, so you would likely already have your armor tanking trained. Okay, there are some smaller distinguishing characteristics that you'll likely find in Mimitar ships. Some of these have become less prevalent due to the recent changes in ships uh, by the CCP Tiracide program, and I will talk about Tiracide a little when we move on to discussing the ship hulls in general. But in the past, uh, ships of a particular size class, like frigates, were uh, arranged in tiers, so tier 1 ships were quite weak and then tier 3 ships were quite strong. Uh, CCP has started to change this so that ships are arranged to perform particular functions and then they don't. It's not the case that tier 3 ships are always going to be better than tier 1s. Or it should, I should rephrase and say that the tiers have, have basically just gone and all of the ships that were tier 1s beforehand and not loved very much have been given new roles that have made them more useful. But what this does mean is that some of these secondary characteristics have a bit of a, a back seat. However, as I was saying, the secondary characteristics which you tend to find on Mimitar ships is that their weapon systems, their high slots for weapon systems, usually leave one or two slots available to be used for utility modules such as energy warfare, a second weapon type, or drone link augmenters, salvagers, probe launchers, and things like that. That is to say, usually you can't fit every single high slot with one particular type of weapon. You'll also find that the Mimitar are quite different from others. Usually Mimitar ships have a higher scan resolution, so that means that you can achieve target locks on small ships faster. However, the drawback is they tend to have quite low sensor strength. In fact, Mimitar ships usually have the lowest sensor strength of a class. What this means is that it's easier to jam a Mimitar ship with ECM than it is any other type of ship of its class. Mimitar ships also tend to have the smallest capacitors of all the ships. This is in some ways due to the fact that all, all Mimitar um, weapon systems, that is, projectile turrets, missiles, and drones are capless weapon systems, so the ships are balanced not to have as strong capacitors. Finally, the Mimitar um, ships, due to the fact that they have speed, agility, and signature radius as their tanking options, usually have a lower amount of raw hit points and buffer available to them, so the brawling setups for Mimitar ships may not be as effective as they would be for the others, because they, they simply don't have the base hit points to, to deal with it. Okay, so that's a brief overview of overriding design characteristics of Mimitar ships. Do we have any questions? those things that make them unique from other races.
Can anyone hear me in class at uni? Please, someone wave. Oh, there's a question. Okay, Callis has asked, what type of ECM attack and defense does Mimitar ships use? I'm going to link to you the first ship that we're going to discuss later, which will be the Reaper, and we can find out there. If you click on the link I just gave you, that's the Mimitar noob ship, the Reaper. If you go to the Attributes tab and scroll right down to the bottom, you'll see in the targeting section that it has a LADAR sensor strength, and that that is coloured with a nice little red colour. So in terms of defending against ECM, and which ECM jammer to use while trying to disrupt Mimitar ships, you're going to be using LADAR jammers, and then LADAR sensor backup arrays or electronic counter-counter measures. Shiloh of Access has asked, say brawling, do you mean it's not as good for solo PvP? Uh, that's definitely not the case. Uh, Mimitar ships in the past have kings of solo PvP, and again, due to the work that CCP is doing to balance the ships at the moment, it's not, strictly speaking, true to say anymore that all Mimitar ships are better than they could be. Um, but what I mean when I say that they don't do so well brawling is that if you were to stop stationary with no speed, agility, signature radius with one Minmatar ship and one, say, Galente ship both hitting each other, chances are the Galente ship would be able to take a lot more damage and due to the high damage output of blasters would actually be able to deal a lot more of damage. However, in something like solo PvP, a lot more of the combat comes down to how well you are manoeuvring your ship, maintaining range, applying electronic warfare and other such things. So it's definitely not true to say that the, the lower effective hit points of a Mimita ship would necessarily mean that it's always going to be at a disadvantage. Uh, Bazooka has asked uh, that he hears Mimita ships are hard to fit. Uh, what are the necessary support skills to fly them well? I will be going over that later so we can discuss that at the end. Okay, that seems to be it. So now I'm going to move on to talking a little bit about projectile weapons. Now, most of you will hopefully be aware that um, there are a number of different weapon systems in the game. The Mimitar bonus flavor are projectile weapons, and you'll find those in the market named as either auto cannons or artillery weapons. Now, some Mimitar ships do have missiles as their primary uh, damage dealing options, but Mimitar ships are the only ones which use projectiles, and thus, well, the only non-pirate faction ones that use projectiles, so they tend to be considered the Mimitar primary weapon system. Now, projectiles are turret, so they behave somewhat similarly to hybrids and energy weapons, if you've been familiar with those before. That they do have some significant differences from the other type of turret-based weapons. The most significant of those is that projectile weapons use absolutely no capacitor when they fire. So unlike lasers, which use a lot of capacitor, and hybrids, which use some capacitor, there is, there is zero capacitor use for running your autocannons or your artillery. This means that even the heavy neutralizing energy neutralizing pressure from enemies, you'll still be able to run your offensive modules. Although you will likely find that your defensive modules and will begin to uh, not have much effect. The other uh, which separates projectiles from the other types of turrets is that due to the ammo available to projectile weapons you have quite a lot of selection over the amount of sorry the different proportions of flavor types of damage that you give as some of you may know there are four different types of damage you can do in eve online that is em or electromagnetic explosive kinetic and thermal uh, hybrid weapons can only deal with thermal and Energy weapons can only deal EM and thermal. Projectile weapons, through their selection of ammunition, can deal all types of damage. Uh, and we will be discussing a little bit later on what the different ammo types are and how to change the damage that you won't do. Now, I mentioned earlier that projectile weapons come in two different types. Like most turrets, there is a short-range, higher damage version, which is called autocannons. And then there is a longer range lower damage version called the artillery. Now, autocannons have very good tracking. 
which means that they're good at firing at fast-moving targets or from fast-moving ships, because tracking is always uh, a two-way street. If you have high tracking against a target, it also means they have high tracking against you. And this makes some sort of sense when you just Mimitar ships are going to be fit for speed if so it's important that their weapons are actually able to operate at the speeds that their ships are. Autocannons also have doubly short optimal ranges. Uh, if you've taken any of the gunnery classes before or paid attention to the way that turrets work, each turret in the game has an optimal range at which, all other things being equal, it will apply its full amount of damage, and then after that there is a fall-off range when the damage begins to go down. The optimal range on ordnance is so laughably short that it's generally not even considered part of the range. And they have, to offset this, incredibly long optimal ranges. Uh, sorry, incredibly long fall-off ranges. So for the most part, Mimitar autocannon ships are going to be firing within their first fall-off range rather than within their optimal range or within the smallest portion outside of the optimal range as you might try to do with other turrets. Now, artillery, as I've already mentioned, is the longer range version. Artillery has the slowest cycle time in game and the highest volley amount. When we talk about the amount of damage or DPS that a gun does, this is a fact of how much damage it does in one round and how long it takes for that second round to go off. So say something like Sturs, which are the hybrid short range turret. Blasters do a medium amount of up front, but they cycle very quickly, so they will fire a new set of medium damage very, very quickly after the first one. Artillery are the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, the first shot that your gun fires is often called alpha damage in EVE, um, but in general, the, the volley damage is the name that we say for, for one round of all of your guns going off at once. Because of this, artillery ships often used in what are called alpha gangs, where you get a lot of ships together and you plan to do as much enough damage in that first round from all of your ships to completely destroy the, the target ship without giving them any opportunity for remote assistance or local repairing. In order to offset the high alpha and high range that you get with artillery, they have the worst tracking available of any sort of ship in the game, sorry, any sort of turret in the game as well. So again, what this means is that if you try to use artillery on fast-moving targets which are close to you and are able to maintain good piloting, and that means that they're able to maintain their transversal against you, chances are your artillery are not going to be able to track them at all and you're going to be doing no damage. So artillery is used for the types of setups I was talking about earlier with the hurricane that maintains range because if anything does get close enough to it, it's not going to be able to actually do any damage. Uh, now, the optimal range artillery does actually have some meaning, but artillery turrets do also have very good fall-offs as well, so you tend to find this is how they're able to operate at such high ranges. Okay, so discounting the Tech 2 ammunitions available, there are a number of different projectile turret ammunition available. There are eight, in fact, and I'm going to link um, to the EU University wiki page on projectile ammunition right there. So if you follow the link, just the first table on there called Tech 2 Ammunition Types will list to you the eight different varieties of projectile ammunition. Uh, projectile ammunition works in both autocannons and in artillery. It's the same type. And you will notice there that each one has a range modifier, cracking modifier, and a type of damage that it does. And we do have a question here from Lisbeth. Uh, when you're fighting in fall-off, how do you decide what range to fight at? Is it one fall-off just outside of the opponent's desired envelope, or just as close as you can manage to orbit? The answer to that is yes to all of those, unfortunately. Um, almost all questions in EVA answered the same way with it depends. In general, you want to be fighting within your first fall-off, because once you're getting outside of your first fall-off, your damage is very, very quickly reducing. However, if 
outside of your first fall off puts you completely outside of your enemy's engagement envelope but still inside yours then it may make sense to maintain that sort of range because you would then be completely safe from their damage and still able to apply some damage to them even if it's quite small. Okay, um, what was the last part of that one? Or just as close as you can manage to orbit. But yes, that's that's the opposite side of that same. You should try to keep as close as you can to maintain the amount, the you know, the highest amount of damage you can do. With um with all working in fall off, it's just one of those things that you have to get used to. If you've flown a lot of um. MR ships in particular, which are very, very long optimal ranges, you might be used to having a look at the optimal range on your ship, or at least on your guns, and then choosing that as your orbit distance when you're fighting with people. Uh, when you're using projectiles, it's not really as simple as that, but that does mean it gives you a lot more flexibility of your ability to, to be at different ranges. Once an MR ship with lasers begins to get outside of its optimal range, it will see damage decrease very, very quickly, range increases, whereas Mimitar ships are a lot more forgiving with that, and you can really begin to pull a lot of range before your damage significantly goes down. Okay, so we were talking about the ammunition type. Uh, you'll notice that EMP, fusion, and phased plasma are the first three. Every one of those has a minus 50% range modifier. Now, the range modifier for ammunition types is towards the optimal range only and not towards the fall off. Because autocannons have such pitiful optimal ranges to begin with, you can almost forget about the penalty that you're getting to optimal range there. Obviously, it will still take some amount of range off of you, but it is certainly not going to cut your in practice workable range of your guns by 50%. It's really only going to shave maybe 10% off. You'll notice that EMP does most of its damage with EM, then there's a little bit of explosive and some kinetic. Fusion does most of its damage as explosive with a little bit of kinetic, and phase plasma does most of its damage as thermal with a little bit of kinetic. And in the last column you'll see that the damage is listed as high. I do have a slight more in-depth um, table for the projectile ammunitions, which I've just linked into class.e-uni there. Now, the numbers here are um, for the small damage type, but you'll notice that the EMP, phase plasma, and fusion there, which we see as having in their largest places 9, 10, and 10, essentially each of those is 12 full points of damage, and you'll notice that the lower ones are only doing 8 full points of damage, and then the lowest ones are only doing 5 full points of damage. This is what we mean when the damage column says high. Those first three, EMP, Fusion and Placema, are the high damage variants, but they do take a range modifier as a penalty. You will notice that there is no high damage variant with Kinetic as its primary damage output. Okay, moving on to the next two, we have Titanium Sabo and Depleted Uranium. Each of those get no range penalty or bonus, which is nice. They do both get a nice tracking modifier, though. Now, because autocannons tend to have very good tracking to begin with, you may find that this tracking modifier doesn't help you very much, but the tracking modifier can help a little bit with artillery. Again, for the most part, we tend to just go with the highest damage output for the artillery, because more often than not, you are attempting to do large amounts of damage with those types of guns. However, you will notice the titanium server does have kinetic as its highest damage type. Sometimes you will see people, especially when we're talking about using Minmatar ships for PvE content, and missions in particular, where you want to be shooting a particular type of damage, will choose to use Titanium Sabo for its high kinetic damage against ships with low kinetic resistances. However, because of the fact that the other first three do more damage than the uh, Titanium Sabo does, you may find that you would actually be better off using the high damage variant of the target ship's second resist hull. This is one of those times when I couldn't, you know, there were too many situations for me to tell you exclusively never to use Titanium Sabo, but it's almost all PvP scenarios, we tend to just use the first three. And then finally, you will see that we have Proton, Nuclear, and Carbonized Lead. 
These ones do get a small amount of king bonus and they get a very large range bonus, 60% each. You of course pay for that very large bonus by them actually having very, very low initial damage outputs. Again, you tend to find that these three ammunitions are almost completely underused. You may find that um, in particular, again, PvE scenarios when it's very important for you to be able to hit with any amount of damage to a particular range, that if you have uh, low skills in projecting your turret DPS, you may have to, to use one of these low damage ones in order to hit out to the range that you can. But outside of some very, very specific scenarios like that, the low damage options are, are almost exclusively ignored. One thing I should say about all sorts of ammunition in the game is that when you are using them for PvP, it is almost always better to use the faction varieties of those. Um, if someone could link something like maybe Republic Base Plasma or Republic Fleet EMP, uh, and you will see that types of ammunition are a lot more expensive than the base types, but they do a lot more damage than the base types. And when it comes to having your ship destroyed rather than having someone else's ships destroyed, it's almost always a good idea for you to um, try and put out as much damage as you can. Okay, now the two uh, variants of these guns can use two different types of ammunition that the Tech 1 variants can't. Uh, I should point out that Tech 2 guns can of course use Tech 1 ammo as well, but uh, one of the many benefits that Tech 2 guns as well as just having increased base DPS is they have a couple of other options available to them. The um, Tech 2 variants of autocannon um, ammunition called Barrage and Hail Barrage is the longer distance version. You get a fifth bonus to the fall off of your guns, but you do take a 25% penalty to tracking. Now, as I'd already meant before, autocannons generally have very good tracking to begin with, and there are some Mimitar ships, such as, say, the Rifter, which we're going to be talking about later, which get a uh, ship bonus tracking as well. So you may find that the penalty to tracking is, is manageable. Barrage is a mostly explosive damage with Elizabeth's Kinetic, and um, it is generally the Tech 2 damage that we use when we're doing kiting or range type of work. Um, hail, on the other hand, is one of those kind of maligned pieces of, of things in EVE where on paper hail can do enormous amounts of damage. However, it has some really severe penalties. You will take a 30 penalty to your tracking speed, a 50% penalty to your fall off, uh, and to your optimal. What this means is that unless you're fighting against a ship that is much, much larger and slower than you, chances are that your actual applied DPS while using hail won't be anything close to what um, the on-paper DPS is. And because of this, almost all high damage short-range work with um, autocannons it tends to be done with the Tech 1 ammunition types. Okay, um, the tech ammunition for artillery is called Tremor and Quake. Tremor is the um, long range ammo type. Uh, you get an 80% range bonus with Tremor, and given that artillery also have really, really fantastically good range to begin with, when you start using Tremor in artillery, that you can get to some very, very scary ranges with that. It does, however, take a 75% tracking speed penalty. Now, that is a huge, huge tracking speed penalty and will ensure that almost anything that's able to keep goods transversal against you or able to be at close range at you, you will not be able to hit while using Tremor in artillery. It is really useful only for sniping at very, very long ranges. With that said, Tremor is fantastically good at what it does. The second type is Quake, which, um, much like... Hail does really, really fantastic amounts of damage. Um, Quake is the ammo that you want to use if you're using, trying to use artillery at the types of ranges that you might use barrage in autocannons for, that kind of middle ground. 
It also comes with some sort of to offset the amount of damage that it does. It's a 75% range penalty and a 25% tracking speed penalty. The drawbacks of Quake pretty much outweigh its benefits. So again, if you're using artillery for anything other than very, very long-range sniping, you mostly use the high-damage Tech 1 varieties rather than using the um, high-damage Tech 2 varieties. Okay, so that's a primer on what makes projectiles different from most other ammunition. Do we have any questions there about projectiles? Uh, Matthias has asked, uh, doesn't quite have a tracking speed bonus. Yes, it does. Sorry, if I said that it was a, a penalty, that's me just misreading my notes. Okay, we don't seem to have any other questions about projectiles, which I guess is good. Okay, so we're now going to be uh, moving on to looking at each of the Mimitar ships, uh, starting with the frigates and moving our way all the way up to the battleships. So the first Mimitar ship that we're going to talk about today will be the Reaper. And now the Reaper is the starter frigate that every Mimitar pilot gets when they start the game, or whenever they dock up in a station where they don't have any assembled ships already. And there you go, thank you, Jim has linked the Reaper. If you could single click on the Reaper to bring up the information about that ship, I'm just going to talk us through how, what aspects of the ship information we're going to be looking at today. Now the first thing we're always going to look at is the description, because the description tab will tell us what uh, ship bonuses and sometimes penalties the ship gets. And you'll see for the Reaper that it gets no per-level bonuses. It just has some flat special ability bonuses. So increasing your Mimitar frigate skill will not change anything about the Reaper. This is something that's true about all of the noob ships. They simply have a base set of bonuses to give you an idea of how you might want to use the ship. But for the most part, as soon as you can afford to upgrade to one of the other frigates, you really should. So we see here that this one has a bonus to 10% velocity, 10% small projectile damage, 15% target painter effectiveness and 15% shield boost amount. And these bonuses mostly tie in with what we've said already about Mimitar ships and that they tend to be fast, they tend to be projectile boats, and they tend to have a, well, m many of them have shield boost bonuses. Um, I haven't mentioned target painters before, but target painting is the Mimitar electronic warfare, and we will be discussing that when we talk about the disruption ships. Okay, the next tab I want you to look at is the third one along, which is called Tings tab. On the fitting tab, we can find out how many low, medium, and high slots the ship has, and also whether it has any turret or launcher hardpoints. In true Mimitar style, the Reaper is tall. It has two lows, two mediums, two highs, and you can choose to either put two launchers or two turrets on it. As we look at other ships in the game, you'll notice sometimes that there are maybe, say, high slots, and you can have five launchers, five turrets. So in a ship like that, it would be up to you to determine whether you want it to be a launcher ship or a turret ship. Or you may find that it has, say, six launchers and two turrets, that sort of thing. And then the last thing that we might look at times is on the Attributes tab, which is the second tab. And on the Attributes tab, there was a lot of information on there. But sometimes we may want to look at the armor and shield subsections just to see how many base armor and shield hit points that ship has. Because again, this can give us a good indicator as to whether it will be a good armor or shield tanking ship. And again, in true Mimitar fashion, the Reaper has 150 armor and 175 shield. So it's fairly balanced in those regards. That's about all I want to say about the Reaper, because as a noob ship, it is mostly quite a dull ship to try and fly, and I would not recommend that you try and put it into any sort of serious use. But if it's the only ship that's available to you, then, you know, use it and enjoy it. As Levan has said in Class Channel, in short, don't fear the Reaper. Yes, it's a, it's a lovely named ship. When you see a Reaper on your overview, you think it's going to be some horrific ship that's going to tear you a new one, when in fact it is a lowly, lowly little starter frigate. Okay, so the first ship proper that I'm going to talk about today is going to be the Rifter. The Rifter is a Mitar combat frigate. When we spoke earlier about the Tiracide movement that CCP is doing, what they've done with the frigate line is they've split them all into various different roles. Now, every race has combat frigates. These tend to be the ones with the most damage and tanking potential. 
uh, attack frigates, which tend to be a little bit, well, in fact, considerably faster than everything else of their race, and they are um, bonused for things like tackling. However, you can still use attack frigates in combat roles. There are disruption frigates, which will be the electronic warfare frigates of the line. There are support frigates, which will be the shield or armor repairing frigates. And then there are exploration frigates, which tend to be the ones used for scanning, probing, and um, profession sites such as archaeology and the like. The Rifter has for many, many years been the pinnacle of the Mimitar frigate line. Uh, if you go to the attributes, sorry, the description tab, we will see that there is a bonus to projectile turret damage and to projectile turret tracking. So this is a ship where both the bonuses are towards the actual damage output of it. Before the Tyrus movement went on, there were many people that would have said that the Rifter was the best um, combat frigate of all of the races due to its speed, versatility, and, and good damage output and slot layout. Now, speaking about the slot layout, if you go to the fittings tab, you will see that we have four high slots, three mediums, and three lows. Having a balanced mid-low slot layout allows the Rifter to be fit as either a shield ship or as a armor ship. And you'll also notice that it has three hard points and two launcher hard points. So with those four highs, that means that you could choose to put four um, weapons up in the top as well for, for maximum amount of damage. Or if you chose to use turrets as your primary weapon, which would be a very good thing to do given that the ship has bonuses to turrets, that leaves you one utility high slot, which could have been used for things like um, energy warfare. The Rifter does have a very good base speed and agility for combat frigate. It is not going to compare to any of the attack frigates now, because the attack frigates are almost all much faster. But given you know, compared to the other combat frigates, not just of the Mimitar line, but of all of the lines, it is one of them the fastest and most agile. The Rifter is also the frigate which tends to be used most commonly as the Tech 1 uh, sorry, it's the level 1 mission running frigate, although most people don't stick around in level 1 missions for long, but because of its kind of, again, its decent damage output and its ability to tank frigate damage pretty well, it's a, a very, very good PvE ship as well. Okay, the second combat frigate in the Mimit line is the Breacher. The Breacher has done very well out of Tyrus side that's gone on, and it is now been brought up in terms of its damage potential to be uh, very, 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 very much better than it had been in the past. Uh, again, if you click on the Breacher and look at the description tab, you'll see that we get one bonus to damage, you get 5% bonus to light missile and rocket damage, and then you get one bonus to shield boost amount, so this is a defensive bonus as well. Now, shield boost amount does mean that in order to utilize that, um, you are going to have to shield tank the breacher and that we're going to have to shield tank it with an actual active module, such as the shield booster or the ancillary shield booster. Now, you can, of course, choose to ignore that bonus and uh, fit the ship uh, as a shield tanker with just buffer on it, and this is quite common as well. But given how good the ancillary shield boosters tend to be, especially things like fitting a medium ancillary shield booster on a frigate, you will also see breacher fittings that use that. Uh, if someone could link the medium ancillary shield boost, would be great, although I won't be discussing it in detail. Now again, looking at the Breacher, it's three high slots and three launcher hard points. There are no turret hard points at all, so your only option for fitting the Breacher is as a, as a missile ship. And also it has three lows and four medium slots, so having the extra medium slot does tend to mean that the Breacher um, can it is most often used as a shield ship. However, again, having a relatively balanced layer of low and mids does mean that you can put a, a mild armor tank on the breacher as well. You sometimes see to be used as a PvE ship because of the selectable damage type of missiles, but it's more common to use the Rifter for a, a small missioning ship.
And again, if we look at the attributes tab on the Breacher, you will find that uh, it has 350 armor hit points and 500 shield hit points as its base. So again, it's it's much more leaning towards having a shield tank on it. Uh, so that's it for the Mimtar combat frigates. You've got the Rifter, which is a nice fast turret ship, which has um, always been very, very popular. And then you've got the Breacher, which is a mostly shield tanked missile ship, which is showing a lot more common usage these days than it had in the past. The next figure I'm going to talk about is the attack frigate of the Mimitar line, which is the Slasher. The Slasher is a ship which I have come to really, really enjoy flying around myself, and I've, I spend a lot of time fiddling with different fits for it. Uh, like all attack frigates, if you look on the description, it has a roll bonus there for an 80% reduction in propulsion jamming system's activation cost. What this means is that um, warp disruptors and warp scramblers, which can be quite cap hungry, uh, warp disruptors in particular can be very, very cap hungry, you can use them with a very, very much reduced capacitor cost on um, attack frigates. And that 80% reduction is not based on your uh, Mimitar frigate level, it's just a, a flat bonus. You'll also see that the Slasher have um, two bonuses to turret damage again. In fact, it's the same two bonuses you're going to find on the Rifter, which is 5% to small projectile and 7.5% to small projectile tracking. And this is why I was saying earlier that even though the attack frigates um, can be thought of as being more tackle orientated than their combat counterparts, they do still make quite capable combat ships as well. Given their ability to be generally much faster, more agile, and maintain range better, you might even find that a very experienced slasher pilot would be able to outgun a, a rifter pilot because of it. Now, the slot layout on the slasher is another one which tends to lend towards it being a shield tanker. And if you are using the slasher to, as in a fleet tackling role, you will almost exclusively be shield tanking the slasher because the armor tank will slow it down. And for the most part, you do want to be um, moving into to range. Now, the slasher has only two lows, four medium, four high slots. It has three turret hard points and no missile hard points. So that means that you cannot fit all four high slots with weaponry. You can only fit your three turrets and then your last high slot, if you put anything in there at all, is going to have to be a utility or assistance type module, such as the energy warfare things we spoke about earlier. So people are linking fits for the Rifter, and I imagine they will link some fits for the Slasher as well. Uh, by all means, guys, if you have any fits, do feel free to link them and share them. However, I will not be discussing them because we simply won't have the time for that. Okay, the next frigate we're going to talk about is the Disruption Frigate for the Mimitar line, and that's called the Vigil. Disruption is, they're all the electronic warfare frigates. So if you have a look on the description tab for the Vigil, you will see that it gets two bonuses to target painters, a 7.5% bonus to target painting effectiveness, and a 10% bonus to target painting optimal range. Target painters are generally the, the least commonly used type of electronic warfare because almost everything that, that you can be done with the target painter can be done by just webbing the target down instead. However, you will find that vigils are used due to their extraordinary base speed. And it used to be the case that the vigil got a per level speed bonus. And when the tier assign happened, the developers decided to keep the, the base speed of the vigil very, very high. So it has a, with, with good skills, the vigil can go as fast as the attack um, frigates can. It's definitely not a ship that's for combat though, it only has two hard points and you can only fit launches on them and there's no bonus to the damage that it does. It does however have five medium slots, like almost all disruption frigates, it's got a lot of medium shots to use up its, um, sorry, to give space for to using the actual electronic warfare modules. Because of its five mid slots you tend to find that the Vigil can also, is also used in other fleet support roles such as running tracking links or running remote sensor boosters and things like that because these modules all run in the mids. So if you do see a Vigil in a gang with other ships and it's not target painting you, it might be an idea to make sure that it's, it's not providing some sort of bonuses to its gangmates. Okay, the support for getting the Mimitar line is called the Burst. 
looking at the description tab for the burst, you'll see that it is a shield healing ship. All of the um, logistics or support frigates are designed to be used with no incoming el- uh, energy transfers. As we discussed the, in the cruiser line when we get there, um, there are some logistic ships which have to be used in pairs or higher because their um, repping output is only useful when they're receiving energy from friends, but none of the frigates work like that. So the burst gets a percent bonus to shield transporter effectiveness, the boost amount, also a 10% reduction in the shield transporter capacity use per level of the Mimitar frigate skill, and they have a flat 500% bonus to the range of shield transporters. Now, uh, support frigates have not very commonly used uh, since their inception because they generally just don't have very, very good defences or output themselves. But they do have a niche usage in areas where only small ships can get in, such as uh, factional warfare outposts, the, the novice and small versions of those. But in general, you are not going to see very many bursts out on the field. Uh, again, it has almost no image capabilities it only has three high slots and only two of those can actually be fitted with turrets and there's no bonus to its damage dealing it does however have a fairly um balanced layer of lows and mids but because you're almost certainly going to be using this in the shield gang uh you and it has nearly twice as many shield hit points as it does armor you're likely to find that the burst is a shield tanker now the last frigate we're going to talk about today is the probe this one is an exploration frigate uh, it does get a bonus to probing scan strength, and also that's a 7.5% bonus per level, and a 5% per level bonus to break out, analyze, and salvage a cycle time. As with all of the expedition frigates, this is the first frigate that you might want to use if you want to get into things like running um, exploration sites, or if you wanted to have a um, a tech one very cheap combat or yeah combat prober for your gang. Uh, the probe is another ship with very, very limited damage output. Um, you can only put two turrets or two launches on it. It has three highs and no damage bonus. Generally, you find them untanked completely because they're just not used in any sort of place where combat goes on. Uh, if you use it for exploration, more often than not, you will use the probe to find the site and then you'll use a different ship to actually run the site. And if you're using it in PvP as a prober, more often than not, you'll find that one of the high slots has a um, a prototype cloaking device in it so that you can cloak up and probe around in peace. There isn't really much else to say about probe. Uh, so that's it for the frigate line. Any questions on those frigates? We are likely going to be running over, though, it looks like. Okay, we don't seem to have any... So we're going to move on to the next ship class, which is destroyers. Um, Destroyers are very, very high damage ships which use frigate-sized modules, but they um, don't have uh, very significant tanks on them. They generally just don't have the slot layout to fit any sort of tank. So you tend to find that they are the, the... proverbial glass cannons, lots and lots of turrets or launchers, uh, so lots of high slots, but, but very, very few mids and lows. The first joy for the Mimitar line we're going to be talking about is the Thrasher. For, since the introduction of Destroyers quite a few years ago, each race only had one Destroyer, and then very recently each race got given a new one, but the Thrasher was the first Destroyer that the Mimitar line had. It's a turret ship, as you can see, there is a 10% bonus to small projectile turret tracking speed and a 5% bonus to small projectile turret damage. So again, this is a dual damage bonus in a sense, because higher tracking is simply going to need more applied DPS. All destroyers also get a bonus to the um, range of their guns. This allows them to engage frigates outside the range that the frigates can engage back again, which is very, very good for them because they have pretty much no tank. Going over to the fitting tab, you'll see that the Thrasher has eight highs with seven hard, sorry, seven turrets and one launcher. So most setups will be seven turrets with some sort of energy uh, mod or seven turrets with a rocket launcher. Artillery Thrashers are used quite a lot um, as kind of pseudo sniping ships and as ganking ships. That is ships which are used for uh, suicide attacks against 
um, non-legal targets in high-sec, or even just as ships that can be used to destroy um, ships with very low buffer tanks. Uh, you'll often find that people that run with very expensive missioning ships like Tengus have actually quite low base hit points and very good repping capacity because repairing incoming damage during missions and the like is a lot more important than having lots of hit points. So very, very cheap ships like Thrashers can be used to kill them very, very quickly because you just drop 10 Thrashers on top of it and their initial damage is enough to get through the, the you know, 1 billion isk worth of ship's hit points. The Thrasher has only close and three mids, so if you're going to fit any sort of tank to a Thrasher at all, um, it might be a shield tank. But more often than not, you find with destroyers that the only tank that they tend to fit is a damage control in the lows. It has a pretty balanced armor and shield um, hit points, so you can armor tank a Thrasher if you so desire. As I said, any of the, any of the Thrashers that I've ever flown have either been completely untanked or just have a, a medium shield extender as their tank. Okay, the next Mimitar ship we're going to be talking about is the nice brand new one. It's called a Talwar. It is quite unique in that it's the only destroyer with a bonus to the micro warp drive signature radius penalty. For those of you that aren't completely familiar with how micro warp drives work, they increase your speed by 500%, but they also increase your signature radius by 500%. So they do make you very, very fast, but they also make you much easier to hit. The Talwar gets a 50 cent per level reduction in its micro warp drive sig penalty, so it's able to take micro warp drive speeds but mitigate quite a lot of the extra damage that that, speed, that micro warp drive activation would give it. You will also see that there is a bonus to light missile and rocket explosive damage per level, so that's only to explosive damage. If you fit EM rockets or missiles to a Talwar, you're not going to get any sort of damage bonus out of it. Due to the fact that the Talwar has high speed and low signature, it's commonly used as a kiting ship, so you'll find it's used with light missile launches in the highs and then a moderate tank, if any at all, and it tries to make, keep out of range of people. But you can fit the Talwar with kits and some sort of armour um, tank on it in order, to, um, in order to work in brawling range as well. You'll notice that like most Mimitar ships, it's balanced two lows, two mediums, and there's not a great deal of difference in its armor and shield capacity. It only has 50 more shield or hit points than it does armor. Seven highs and seven launchers mean that there is pretty much only one thing you're going to do with your highs in the Talwar, and that's fit it for max damage. And that's it for the Mimitar Distress. Now we're going to move on to cruisers. Cruisers, again, um, have been tier assigned, so there's no longer tiers of cruisers, and each of the cruisers has a particular role to fill. The first one we're going to be talking about is the Rupture. This is the combat cruiser for the Mimitar line. Looking at the bonuses on the Rupture, you will again see that this is primarily a turret bonus. It gets a dual damage bonus here, one to firing speed and one to damage at 5% per level to each. This means that if you're using the Rupture for PvE activities, you're probably going to find that you rip through your ammo much faster than you have done in any other type of ship, but it does of course increase the amount of applied damage that it does. Um, the Rupture, again, has a nice balanced layout of defences. It has five lows and four medium slots. You will often see that an armour tanking Rupture will fill the middle slots with um, tackling mods, such as dual web setup, and it will attempt to use auto cannons and pin things down and destroy them that way. And the shield Ruptures will generally fit with artillery, and they will try and stay at range and use their relatively good base speed to um, to keep out of the damage envelope of anything they're engaging. It does have five high slots and only four turret hardpoints, so you can fit a launcher into that last high slot, there is one launcher hardpoint, or you can, if you're using a brawling setup, again, use some sort of energy neutralization or vampire up there in the top as well. Due to its higher base armor, amount and it's more low slots, you will get more effective hit points out of the armor rupture, but as I said, shield ruptures are just as common. The rupture does have a nice generous drone bay as well, and I haven't discussed drones on any of the ships beforehand because they haven't really had significant enough drone bays to make it worthwhile. 
but you do have a um, 30 cubic meter drone bay and a 30 cubic sorry and a 30 megabit drone bandwidth on the rupture so you can field um, a flight of light drones with a spare or one medium and four lights in the rupture as well uh, one of the reasons why the rupture is very um, commonly used for pve missioning is well any sort of missioning, I should say, is due to the selectable damage type of its guns and the fact that you can field drones in order to take out anything which is fast enough to get underneath the um, tracking speed of your guns. Okay, the um, attack cruiser, so much like the frigate line, attack cruisers tend to be faster and not quite as much um, focused on damage as the combat variants, but the attack cruiser is the stabber. As with all Minmata ships, the Stabber is the fastest of all of the attack cruisers. If we look at the Stabber, we'll see that it is, strictly speaking, a turret damage bonus ship. But if you're looking to do damage with any sort of turret ship and it's a Minmata cruiser, the Rupture would be a much more um, commonly used thing for that. The Stabber does have a very good role as a frigate killer, though. It's able to, um, due to its high base speed and its damage output on turrets, it's able to put the lowest calibre guns on it and uh, catch up with many frigates and destroy them with, with ease. It does have six high slots split into four turrets and two launchers. So the common setups are just that, four turrets and two launchers, or sometimes you'll see four turrets and then uh, a set of neutralizers up there, a set of smalls or sometimes even a small in the mid. Again, four lows and four mids, so you could armor or shield tank the stabber. Um, sometimes you'll see it used as an armor ship with either dual prop on it to be a heavy tackler, but more often than not you find stabbers as shield tanks to, so that, to take advantage of its high base speed. Now, the disruption cruiser in this line is the Bellicose. And the Bellicose is a ship that I, again, have come to love since the Tyrus side changes. Uh, it used to be quite maligned because target painting is not all that important to most gangs. And um, bringing a, a cruiser along with a targeting bonus was never particularly useful before. But again, if we look at it now, it has a, um, a split bonus, one to target paint to effectiveness, but it also has a damage bonus now. It has a 5% bonus to um, rapid light, heavy assault, and heavy missile launch with rate of fire. Now, it's not able to do the same kind of damage that you might be able to get out of a rupture, or its Caldari kind of equivalent might be something like the Caracal, which has got more high slots and um, more launch hard points. But the Bellicose is able to fit four launchers into its four high slots. And due to the fact that it's a missile ship with painting, it, is, it can be very, very effective in that regard, and that the target painters make the missiles hit for more damage, especially if you're firing them against smaller targets. Because it's a disruption ship, the Bellicose does have more mid slots than it does lows. It has five mid slots to its four lows. And again, it has a fairly decent amount of armour or shields capabilities. So it has 1,200 armour and 1,400 shields. Because fitting a shield bellicose would cut into its ability to fit target painters, if you're using this ship for a exclusively target painting role, so you're fitting two or three target painters onto it, maybe even up to four or five target painters onto it, if you're not worried about having any sort of um, propulsion modules on there, then the armour version of the Bellicose is almost certainly going to be your only option for a respectable tank on it. But if you're trying to fit this up to have maybe only one target painter on it and use it as a combat ship, you may find that a shield tank is a, a better option for you so that you can maintain the lows for um, some agility and a lot of damage mods. You can fit three ballistic controls on a Bellicose relatively easily. Yeah, you will sometimes see bellicose um, come along with alpha in gangs, like the types of gangs I talked about earlier, where you're killing everything with your first shot, because target painting something that you're sniping at can really increase your applied damage. Uh, Zyman has asked, how does our sensor strength affect the Mimitar ships? Um, all ships have a sensor strength, and this determines how easy it is for ECM to jam them. 
Um, each of the different races uses a different type of sensors. So Mimitar use LADAR sensors, um, Kaldar use gravimetric. Galenta use min mag uh, magnesimetric. Metric, there we go, and Amar uses radar. You're using a radar jammer against a LADAR sensor ship. You're going to have very, very low effectiveness. Uh, it's important to match up this with your sensors. So that's really the, the reason why it's called LADAR sensor strength, is just to, to add an extra level of complexity into the way the ECM works to try and offset how powerful ECM is. Okay, uh, moving on, the support cruiser in the Minmatar line is called the Scythe. It is a shield healing boat again. Uh, you'll notice there's a 12.5% bonus to the boost amount for shield transporters and a 5% reduction to shield transporter capacity use per level. As mentioned earlier, this is one of those ships which is designed to work um, without any incoming energy transfer. You can usually, well, you should be able to set up a Scythe using a few capacitor modules in your mids and lows to be able to be cap stable with its propulsion module running and with all of its um, shield transporters working. And like um, other logistic ships, it also has some roll bonuses which are not based on your level in the cruiser skill. This one has a 1000% bonus to shield transporter range and a 100% bonus to your logistic drone repair amount. Now again, there's a reasonable um, drone bay on the um, side that has a 45 cubic meter drone bay and a 45 megabit bandwidth. So you can fit uh, four mediums and a small or you can fit um, a field uh, so you can a flight of logistics drones and a slightly smaller flight of ECM drones or damage drones something along those lines if you wanted to. Again because it's a shield transport ship much like the um, burst from earlier it's almost exclusively going to be shield tanked. And again, um, if you did choose to fit the scythe out for damage, you're going to have a very hard time getting any decent damage out of it. It's only got three highs, and those are split into two turrets and one launcher. Jade has asked about shield transporters. Um, shield transporters do not trans. Yeah, they, they're not transferring your shield to the target shield. They 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 are healing essentially. But uh, that is perhaps a pick that's better used in Logistics 101. But yeah, it, it transfers your cap into your target's shield. They use up your capacitor and then give shield out to other people. Okay, so that is it for the cruiser line. Rupture, Stammer, Bellicose, and Scythe. Any questions, any other questions about those? Okay, looks like we're good for questions on that. And the next class of ship we're going to be talking about is the battle cruisers. Um, the Mimitar, well, all battle are split into two different roles again. Battle cruisers have had the tier side treatment, so they are combat battle cruisers and attack battle cruisers. The, uh, there are two combat battle cruisers. The first one we're going to be talking about is the Hurricane. The Hurricane, again, is a turret boat. You've got a 5% bonus to projectile turret damage and a 5% bonus to projectile turret rate of fire. You will notice that the role bonus on a Hurricane is that it can fit Warfare Link modules. Now, um, Gang Assist modules like Warfare Links are really outside the scope of Mimitar Ships 101, but uh, this means that one of your high slots on the Hurricane, and when we talk about it the Cyclone, can be used for a module that you can fit to your ship that will allow everyone in your fleet to benefit from the fact that you have fitted this module. That's what a Warfare Link is, but that is essentially all I'm going to say about Warfare Links for the moment. If we look at the fitting up on a Hurricane, you will notice that it has six lows and four medium slots. So this would lend, it, lend you to the conclusion that the Hurricane is a strong armour tanker, and you would be right in that conclusion. However, if you look at the Attributes tab, again, you'll notice that the actual armour and shield capacities are fairly balanced. It's 4,500 armour, 4,250 shield. So even though you would not be able to fit as strong of a shield tank on a Hurricane, especially once you consider that you're likely going to have to have a propulsion module in there, and maybe even some sort of um, tackle module in there, but not generally the way Hurricanes are used. For a shield setup, you're almost exclusively going to be using an artillery um, setup and you're staying out of range, so having a, a weaker tank in the shield setup isn't so much of a problem because you're going to be mitigating damage through your range and speed. 
Anyway, getting back to talking about the um, damage capabilities of the Hurricane, it's a seven high slot boat with only six turret hard points. There are three launcher hard points if you so decide to do that. However, the most common setups are to have all six turrets filled and then use that seventh slot uh, for a medium loot. You will sometimes see that seventh slot used for um, a missile hard point though if there's energy disruption is not going to be much of a concern. Uh, the Hurricane for many, many years was, again, were considered one of the strongest, if not the strongest, um, battle cruiser until the Tyroside effect has brought many other ships up to its level. But yeah, the Hurricane and the Caldari Drake for a, a very long time were the the, the most commonly used battle cruisers. And uh, the Hurricane did have one of its utility high slots taken away and quite a lot of its grid taken away to um, offset the fact that it was plainly just brilliant to everything that it could do. Okay, the next cruiser we're going to be talking about in the um, Mimitar line is the Cyclone. Uh, the Cyclone op benefited quite a lot from the Tiro side, so where the Hurricane actually got some nerfs, the Cyclone got some really nice buffs to it. It did have a bit of a small buff even before Tyroside due to the inclusion of the ancillary shield boosters that I spoke about earlier. If we look at the Cyclone's uh, per level bonuses, it's a 5% bonus to heavy missile and heavy assault missile rate of fire. So the Cyclone is now a missile ship. On, it used to be a ship with a split weapons loadout, so you could, you could and you were encouraged to fit both missile and turrets, but uh, it's now been focused as a missile ship. But that 7.5% shield demand has always been there. So when the ancillary shield boosters came in, which are very, very strong shield boosters, then the Cyclone did see a, a new lease of life as a ship that could have a very high burst tank. Again, you could fit more weapon length modules to a Cyclone. And again, we will see that in its um, high slot arrangement, you have seven high slots and five launcher turrets. Uh, sorry, five launcher hard points. The two remaining hardpoints can be used for turrets. There are two turret hardpoints on the Cyclone still, but again, you're more likely to find that you've got um, things like energy neutralizers up there. Again, because of the um, very strong bonus that you can get out of the Cyclone to active shield tanking, it's almost exclusively used as a shield tanker. It's got a big chunk more base shield hit points than it does armor. It's got uh, 5,000 versus its uh, 3,750 for armor. But it does have another balanced slot layout. It's five lows, five mids. This does mean that if you are shield tanking the Cyclone, you can fit quite a strong amount of um, damage modules in the lows. However, you may find you're going to run into kind of CPU problems if you try and fill the entirety of the lows with um, modules to increase your damage. Check my notes. Okay, so the and um, that's it for the battle cruisers. The next battle cruiser we're going to be talking about is the Tornado, and that is in the um, attack battle cruiser category. Now, attack battle cruisers across all of the uh, races are very, very different from their combat counterparts. Uh, in the frigates and cruisers, the combat and attack battle cruisers had some changes between each other, mostly to do with their speed and damage potential. But attack battle cruisers are significantly different from combat varieties. Their biggest change is that instead of using medium weapons like all cruisers and battle cruisers, they use large project well large turrets, the all turret ships, and the Mimitar one of course uses projectile turret. So if we look at the tornado, you'll see it's a five percent bonus to large projectile rate of fire and a five percent bonus to large projectile turret fall off. Now the roll bonus there for a ninety five percent reduction in grid and a fifty percent reduction in CPU is is essentially so that the very high fitting requirements of large turrets can actually still be fit on a ship which does not have the amount of power grid and CPU that a battleship does. When we look at the fitting panel on um, NATO, like all of the attack battlecruisers, it has eight high slots, eight turret hard points, and no missile target points, so you're likely to be fitting all of the highs with missile, sorry, with, um, with guns. And like all um, attack 
battle cruisers, it has fairly weak base defences. If you look at the armour and shield capabilities of this ship on the attributes tab, you'll see they're around about 1,800 hit for both. That is a significant amount less than you would see on, say, the Hurricane, which we just looked at, and that one had near to yeah 4,500 for both shield and armour. So we're talking less than the base amounts. Again, for the most, tend to find that the Tornado, if it has any sort of tank on it at all, it has a very, fairly light shield tank on it because it has just that extra mid slot. And also, you will generally find that um, tornadoes are used for their extremely high alpha damage. And you do see auto cannon tornadoes because uh, tornadoes do have, they are pretty fast and agile for battle cruisers like all Mimitar ships, so you can get auto cannon fittings for them, but they're, they're really very commonly used as snipers. Because of that, you're going to be using a lot of range-enhancing modules in the lows and mids, as well as damage modules. So if there's any sort of tank on it, it's usually just a one or two slot shield tank. The Tornado is also a vertical ship, and that makes it better than all other ships. If you don't know what I mean by that, if you look at the... Uh, if you click on the picture to get a nice little 3D render of it, you'll see that the Tornado is a ship which is mostly up and down. Okay, so that's it for battle cruisers. Any questions about those? Bearing in mind that we have about minutes left, and I've still got the battleships to talk about. So, a son of Adam has asked, "Can I have one?" A yes for the princely sum of probably something like eighty million. You can have one. Let's see how much they sell for in hey. Oh, they're really cheap, actually. They're only seventy million. I actually have four or five will chat because I like them. Anyway, uh, we're going to move on to the battleships. Now, battleships have not had the tier aside um, yet, so battleships are still arranged in three tiers. What this means is that the one ship uh, generally has lower defences, fewer modules, and lower um, ability to actually output damage than the um, tier two and tier three, and as you go up the tiers, they do get better. Now, it's not strictly true to say that because of the different bonuses that the ships have and the different layouts, you know, you can still do you know, quite a lot with Tier 1 battleships. It's not the case that Tier 3 battleships are always better. But what is the case is that they require more materials to make, so the Tier 3 battleships can be a lot more expensive than the Tier 1s. So the Tier 1 battleship for Mimitar is called the Typhoon. Now, the Typhoon is a, a really odd ship, and you'll probably see from this one that it's kind of different from all of the ships we've discussed so far. It's a ship where it has so much versatility that it actually works against it to an extent. However, with very high skills, because of the lots of different options for actually outputting damage, um, the Typhoon can do more damage than, say, the Tempest, which is the next one we'll be talking about. So looking at the um, attributes, sorry, the description tab for the Typhoon, you'll see that it's a 5% bonus to large projectile turret rate of fire and a 5% bonus to torpedo and cruise missile launcher rate of fire. So that's two damage bonuses to two different types of weapon system. So rather than being two damages to one type of system, you have to do that. If you go to the fittings tab, you'll see that it's an eight high slot boat, but it only has five launchers and five turrets. So if you wanted to get the full damage potential out of this, you're going to have to fit a 5-3 split of either launchers and turrets. Looking at the um, slot arrangement of the Typhoon, you'll see that it has seven lows and four mids, so it's almost exclusively an armour tanker. Also, looking at the um, attributes tab, you'll see that it has more armour hit points, although again, they're fairly balanced. It's 6.2 thousand to, to 5.4 thousand. One of the things that's very, very interesting about the Typhoon is it has a very large drone capacity and it has a decent drone bandwidth. In fact, it can field a full flight of heavy drones or sentry drones with a few spares, or full flights of smalls and mediums. What this means for the Typhoon is that if you have very high missile skills, and very high turret skills, and very high drone skills, you're able to do an extraordinary amount of damage for a Tier 1 battle cruise, uh, battleship. Sorry. 
But if you don't have any of these things maxed out, then chances are you're going to be able to do more oomph out of things like the Tempest and the Maelstrom. Now, because of the fact this ship has essentially three utility high slots, depending on which way you want to take it, the Typhoon is also commonly used uh, as an energy neutralising ship with some damage potential as well. So you would fit um, five torpedo launchers, three energy neutralizers like the heavy energy heavy energy neutralizers and then you can just park your ship next to the enemy and do massive amounts of damage on them and loot them out while you're at it it doesn't tend to make a very um pve ship due to the fact that you can't use the the massive you can't use all of its highs for the same amount of um for the same type of weapon system sorry however it can be used shining but it's not common to find it that way as I man has asked kind of about the general rig setup for the ships too, I'm not really going to have enough time to talk about it. And also, there's nothing particularly unique about the way you would rig a Mimitar ship versus the way you would rig any other ship. For the most part, you want to use your rigs to offset those compromises that you've made in your module setup. So... If you've did to shield tank your ship and you don't have a particularly good EM resistance already because you haven't managed to put an EM resistance module on, then you may wish to rig your ship for a little bit of shield um, capacity and an EM resistance plug. But strategies for rigging ships aren't really racially specific, they're more role specific. You may wish to end one of the um, fitting classes. I know Saloon has done a few very recently, and they've been very good, so you'd be able to get a recording on that. Okay, so the um, the Tier 2 battleship in the Mimitar line is called the Tempest. It's another ship which is not able to field a full rack of guns in its highs, but again, this can be very useful in its regard. But looking at the ship bonuses, you'll see that it's a 5% bonus to large projectile turret rate of fire and a 5% bonus to large projectile turret damage. So again, dual damage bonus on the um, Mimitar ship here, and both to the same type, which is nice. However, looking over at the fittings tab, you'll see eight high slots, but only four turret hard points. So again, you can, sorry, only six turret hard points. So you can fit the last two as energy newts, or you can fit them with launchers. There are four launchers there if you want to use them. The Tempest is um, quite a, um agile ship for a battleship. Obviously, battleships tend to be very, very slow and clunky to begin with, but of all of them, it's one of the faster ones. So you do tend to find Tempest is used in a shield setup, um, just for that reason. Especially, um, there are some people... That I would never do this because I'm not that brave, but there are some people who like to do solo PvP in Tempests as a battleship because of its fairly fast speed. If you do put the shield tank on it uh, with some auto cannons and you don't mind overheating and using a few drugs, you can make the Tempest go, you know, the high, the high teens in um, tens of meters per second, so by hundreds of meters per second, so you can get it close to like two kilometers a second. Uh, and that's the ship that's also often called the Nano Tempest because you generally use a lot of nanofibers in the lows to make it go that fast. Uh, the Tempest is an okay mission ship. It's a fairly good PvP ship, but um, it's not, you know, the pinnacle of PvE. Tempests are quite often used in. Um, the types of gangs where you do want to be using those extra utility highs though. So sometimes they're used in remote repair gangs. They are quite common for use in incursions because you can fit shield transporters and energy and transporters in those spare highs and that can help out the, the rest of the gang in an incursion. It's got a fairly balanced of, of armour and shield hit points however. So you can armour tank the Tempest almost as easily as you can shield tank it. Okay, and the final ship we're going to be talking about today is the Maelstrom. Uh, the Maelstrom is the tier 3 of the um, battleships. It has a 5% bonus to large projectile turret rate of fire and a 7.5% bonus to shield boost amount. So again, the Maelstrom is almost exclusively used with a shield tank on it. 
Not always a shield boosting tank. You know, quite often you'll see it used with a buffer tank, both for PvP and for PvE. Uh, well, for mission PvE, it's usually a boosting setup. For incursions, it's generally a buffer setup. Well, it's always a buffer setup for incursions. Uh, it's a ship which is able to use its um, full eight high slots for guns. So there's eight high slot, sorry, eight turrets. There are three launchers there, but I personally have never seen anyone put launchers on a maelstrom. And again, it has a um, nice general usual Mimitar slot layout and armor shield hit, hit points layout to mean you can armor tank it if you want. It's five lows, six mids, and then it has 7,500 armor and 8,000 shield. As I said, I've never really seen it do anything other than shield tanking, though. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it for what I wanted to talk about uh, in terms of the ships that we've got available to us now. We have around about five minutes now for me to answer any sort of questions that we have about the battleships or any other questions that you've got. I knew when I scheduled this class that we were really going to be pressed for time, but it was the only time that I, I, that I could find at this time of day. There's been a lot of call for classes at this time of day. Okay, I've got a question here from Jim Parsons. For level 4 missions, how well do the large turrets and short ammo hit NPC cruisers? Is it better to use medium drones and a drone damage amplifier too in the low slots? I would definitely use medium drones on, I mean, are, you, are we talking about the Maelstrom or the Pest? I don't actually have an, I, any idea what the drone bay on the Pest is like, having never flown one. Let's see, 75. Okay, so both of them are able to do it fairly well. Yeah, um, well, the Maelstrom, if you're doing missions with large guns, then yes, anything smaller than kind of battle cruisers, are, if they're getting close to you, are going to be tough for you to, to um, think. I don't actually have a Maelstrom level 4 missioning setup because it's not a ship that I use for doing missioning myself. However, I would strongly recommend that you use um, some drones to, to target anything that you can't get a hand on. Uh, if there's anyone in the channel that does have experience using a Maelstrom for level 4 missioning, do please uh, let us know and I'll, uh, I'll uh, let you know about that. In terms of whether using damage amplifier is a good idea or not, I think that's really going to count to how, how often you use your drones to actually engage those targets. Now, when I do do level 4 missions with um, turret ships, usually I'm actually using the um, Dominics with blasters on it. So they track pretty well to begin with. So in, obviously in my experience of using drones, it's going to be very, very different from the, the Maelstrom. Uh, Bazooka Kane has asked us to Mimitra ships looking to solo PvP, which frigate would you recommend? If you'd have asked me this a year ago, I definitely would have said Rifter. Now I'm going to say Slasher. Uh, the, the four mid slots on the Slasher really open up a lot of different op um, options for what you can do with it. I really like medium artillery shield booster brawler fit or an artillery and tracking disruption kiting fit for both of those ships. As usual, as you will see on his Evolturist blog, has some really, really good articles about using Slashers and Condors as, slow, as solo PvP ships. Um, now, with that said, the Rifter is still able to be a very, very competitive um, solo PvP frigate. And for the Rifter, my kind of preferred sm small or one-on-one -on -one fit would be a um, 200 plate, some autocannons, a NOS, um, and then a Scram web and an afterburner. But I think you'd have one low left there, so probably an, an enam or whatever resistance mod you've got the CPU to put on. Um, Simon has asked, I don't know if this is already discussed or not, but besides projectile turrets not leading cap, is there any major differences in the other races? Um, mostly it's to do with their tracking and their ranges. Um, projectile turrets, certainly autocans, have really, really small um optimal, very, very good tracking and long, long fall-offs. Uh, you find that the opposite is true of um, 
energy turrets, which tend to have very good optimals, fairly kind of standard to poor tracking, and then okay-ish fall-offs, and then blasters are a little bit in the middle. And Matthias has asked, are we turrets and ship bonuses? For those ships with bonuses to rate of fire, is it more beneficial to fit gyros or tracking enhancers in the lows for applied DPS? That's going to depend a lot on what sort of ships you are firing them at. Uh, if it's a ship that is able to evade you, or more of a, you know, to, to evade your incoming fire particularly well, then yes, you may find that tracking enhancers will give you more actual applied DPS. In terms of if you are firing against ships of the same class of you or bigger, so if you are setting up um, a Tempest to fire at frigates, then adding lots and lots of gyros isn't going to help you very much there because you're just not going to be able to hit them particularly well. Uh, frigates is a really bad example because if you're shooting frigates with a Tempest, you're really doing it wrong. Well, outside of incursions, that is. But if you are, say, shooting at players, then sure, the gyros are going to make a, a, a lot more difference than the tracking enhancers do. Okay, Jim Parsons has asked for love streams with the cat booster setup. Will I be chewing through the uh, cat booster 800s or will I only have to use them occasionally? Uh, it depends on how well you're able to dagger the damage that's incoming from the missions. Now, this is again something that's just covered in more detail in missions 101 and 102 probably. But uh, with most shield boosting ships, rather than the types of passive ships that you tend to get, like rattlesnakes and drakes, uh, you're not going to be required to run your shield booster all the time. Uh, there's really two kind of schools of, in terms of the shield boosters. There's the fitting that we linked earlier, which has an extra large shield booster um, and then some shield boost amplifiers and then a capacitor booster to keep the shield booster going because you can't perma run it, or at least to, to maintain your cap. And then there is using a very, very expensive, slightly smaller like dead space module, which you can perma run. If it's the setup that's linked above with the extra large shield booster, then no, you don't need to run either the booster or the booster all the time. What you need to be doing or what you should be doing is allowing your shields to go down to somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. 30 if you're feeling really on the edge, 50 if you're a little bit more cautious. And then start running your booster for a little while until you can get your shields back up to somewhere stable around about the 50 to 60 or 70 percent mark. Then turn your booster off. And then as you begin to notice that you can't keep up with that in terms of your cap capabilities, run your cap booster for a while. Both your shield and your capacitor reach their peak recharge, their natural recharge rate, around about 25%. Um, Seamus did some very good calculations that proved it to be almost exactly 25%, but it's one of those things where in practice you probably don't want to push it down quite that far. So once you notice that you're not able to maintain your shield boosting at 30% capacitor, that's when you start using your cap boosters. But again, don't bother using your cap booster to bring your cap all the way up to 100. As soon as you get it back up above a reasonable buffer against your recharge, so somewhere around about the 50% mark, I would say, that's when you can stop using your cap boosters as well. Okay, uh, we really have run out of time now, unfortunately. I had only scheduled an hour for this class, and it was beneficial that the thing happening at 2 o'clock has been moved back to half 2, but it's now half past 2, and I would like the people in the class and myself to be able to go off onto the next event on the calendar. So um, thank you all, guys. Uh, if you've got any further questions or if you've got any comments, particularly if you felt the class was very rushed, because it was, then do please put them into the forum topic for this class and... Um, then either myself or whoever is running this class next will be able to take that into account and make sure that the things that we glossed over very quickly today were uh, brought into more clarity next time. I'll just link for you the class um, for this. Sorry, the, the forum top for this class in class at uni. There it is. So yeah, any comments, good or bad, about the content, then do please put them there because that's how the teachers get better. That's it, guys. Uh, I'm going to stick around for about just three more minutes, and then I'm going off to for some pew-pew.